Houston Astros were not a large part of any preseason conversation, but they started strong and they stayed strong, winning the National League West with a club record 96 wins. And no clincher was ever more dramatic than Houston. A no-hitter by Mike Scott. Now the hitter is Will Clark. He's 0 for 3. Swing and a bouncer. This could be it. Davis runs to the bag. Game is over. No hitter. Astros win the championship. What a way to do it. A no hitter. Mike Scott has just thrown his first career no hitter. And the Astros are the National League's champions of the West. ABC Sports is proud to present the National League Championship Series of 1986. The New York Mets, champions of the East, and the Houston Astros, champions of the West. In the opening game, the pitchers, Dwight Gooden for the Mets, they call him Dr. K for good reason. Mike Scott for the Astros. Lately, he's been called great, also for good reason. When it opened in April 1965, it was called the eighth wonder of the world, the Astrodome. It was so impressive, even the name of the primary tenant was changed from Colt 45s to the Houston Astros. That's part of the compromise, I guess, of moving the game of baseball indoors. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson, and welcome to the 1976 National League Championship Series. As you know, I am sure this, for the second year, is a best of seven, and many people feel this matchup between the Astros and the Mets could well go the limit. These two teams came into being in 1962. The Mets have been to two World Series. They won in 69. They lost in 73. The Astros have never been to the World Series. They were the Western Division champions in 1980, but they lost in five games to the Philadelphia Phillies, one of the great playoff series of all time. And one picture still sticks in my mind in the aftermath of that exciting series. It was this. Outfielder, the brilliant outfielder of the Houston Astros, Jose Cruz, sitting all by himself, tears running down his face after the great effort. So close, but just one run short. And I should tell you, it is still a burr under the saddle of six of these Houston Astros who took part. We'll talk specifics about this series with Tim McCarver in just a moment. Well, Jim Deshaies won 112 games, but primarily as a starter this year, Jeff Calhoun could be uh, a situation pitcher where he comes in in the middle innings. The one problem, I think both managers are going to go with their starters so long that I think all long relievers are going to be out unless the games become extra inning ball games. Could be, and, and you know, there's always Walter Mitty jumps up every year, doesn't he? <laughs> So you never know <laughs> he's going to be. So <laughs> it could be Calhoun. It could be almost anybody on either side. But let's go now to the offensive side of it, presuming we do have some base runners in this series. And I thought it was interesting to talk to Hal Lanier as to whether or not he might change his tactics, maybe a little ki a different kind of a game plan in a seven-game series. So I put the question to him, and this is how he answered it yesterday. No, Keith, I think, you know, we have to stay within ourselves. That's the most important thing in, in a playoffs and especially during the season, too. But, you know, we've played very aggressive ball throughout the whole season, and we're going to continue to play that. You know, we have to we have to get our first two people on. We have to steal bases. We have to put pressure on the defense. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why we won the Western Division and why we won 96 ball games. So, you know, they're going to have the green light unless, you know, we get way behind and late in the ball game and where we, we need a three-run home run from a Glenn Davis or whoever. Uh, we'll put the hole on them. But other than that, we're going to play the, the same same brand of baseball that we played throughout the whole season. you got to expect them to be hauling it. If they do get those uh, first two guys on, they they got to be running on Gary. There's no doubt about it. But Gary's really uh, better than Alan Ashby. You know, I like Gary's chances better than I do Ashby's. And both staffs are going to make it tough on the catchers because both staffs are slow to home plate. Uh, but we're going to probably do a little pitching out or something early, give them something to think about. Leading off. Igniter of the Mets offense. He stole 31 bases. Number four, center fielder Len Dykstra. Batting second, 
He hit a career high 320 during the regular season number six. Second baseman Wally Backman. Batting third. He finished among the league leaders in batting average, hits, runs, and game-winning RBIs, number 17, first baseman Keith Hernandez. Batting fourth, the only Mets player to knock in 100 or more runs in two seasons, number eight, catcher Gary Carter. Batting fifth, he became the first National Leaguer to be voted a starter on the All-Star team in each of his first three Major League seasons, number 18, right fielder Darryl Strawberry. Batting sixth, He's been with the Mets longer than any other current Mets player. Number one, left fielder Mookie Wilson. Batting seventh, the eighth leading hitter in the National League. Number 22, third baseman Ray Knight. Batting eighth, he hit 280 in the last 33 games of the season. Number three, shortstop Rafael Santana. Batting ninth and warming up in the bullpen, the 1985 Cy Young Award winner, number 16, Dwight Gooden. And now for your Western Division champion, Houston Astros. The manager, number 22, Hal Lanier. Leading off, he was second on the club in the National League in stolen bases, number 28, center fielder, Billy Hatcher. Batting second, he led the Astros in walks, runs, and stolen bases, number 19, second baseman, Bill Doran. Batting third, he set career highs in every offensive category of the season, number 29, third baseman Danny Walling. Batting fourth, the second Astro ever to hit 30 home runs in a season, number 27, first baseman Glenn Davis. Batting fifth, he had the fourth highest batting average in the National League, number 17, right fielder Kevin Bass. Batting sixth, four-time Astros' most valuable player, number 25, left fielder, Jose Cruz. Batting seventh, he has caught three no-hitters in his major league career, number 14, catcher, Alan Ashby. Batting eighth, a native Houstonian who's making his second league championship appearance, number 12, shortstop, Craig Reynolds. Batting ninth and warming up in the bullpen. He became only the second right-hander and fourth National League hurler to strike out 300 batters in the season. Number 33, Mike Scott. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will please remain standing for the presentation of the colors by the Texas Army National Guard. I can just imagine the public address announcer at uh, Shea Stadium already beginning to hone for his introduction <laughs> when they come <laughs> back there. Huh? Michael White now will sing the national anthem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the New York Mets and your Houston Astros invite you to honor America and join Michael White in the singing of our national anthem. So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and a bright stars to the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Flag was. Stuck. 
still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free. Well, it's been a pretty good year in the city of Houston. They had the Rockets playing for the NBA championship, and now they've got the Astros going for the National League pennant. And now to throw out the first pitch to get the 1986 National League Championship Series underway, the Vice President of the United States, George Bush, calls Houston home. And you know what? He knows what he's doing. Because he was the captain of the 1948 Yale team. Wait a minute. I'll take it back. <laughs> i tell you, the kind of schedule and rigors of life that this man goes through on a daily basis right now would shorten up your throw a little bit anyway. <laughs> he, des he deserves to lose a couple of yards off the fastball. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to stop by and visit with us in a little while. But he has a baseball background. Played on the Yale team, first base in 47 and 48. And captained the team in 1948. All right, the Astros are in the field. Outside, it is uh, Cruz, Hatcher, and Bass in the outer perimeter. Inside on the infield, it is Davis at first ball. He has some other tools as well. He's got an outstanding fastball, but his split finger fastball is the, pitcher, is the pitch that's really turned him around. As a matter of fact, Tony Gwynn, fine hitter of the San Diego Padres, put it best. He said, if everybody and the league threw the split finger fastball like Mike Scott, then the hitters would be out of a job and all you'd need would be pitchers and catchers. That's how effective he has been this year. And he freely loves to advertise the fact that he doesn't know where, this, where it's going either. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, the Mets are ready to go as Lenny Dykstra comes to the plate. He has walked 58 times. He has struck out 56 times as... 295 batting average, followed by Wally Backman and then Keith Hernandez. Very important, these first two men in the batting order for both teams. Third baseman Walling comes in. Dykstra loves to punt it. Rolls it sharply down to first. Glenn Davis picks it up and tags it out. You've got one away on one pitch. Glenn Davis actually in front of first base. And that's where infielders align themselves. The first baseman playing in even with the line and the third baseman way in. And that was no contest. Dykstra tried to get that ball in the direction of the second baseman and hit the seam between the pitcher and the first baseman, but was unsuccessful. They play on the artificial surface here, the rug, but this is not a hot rug. It is not like Cincinnati. It is not like Philadelphia. The ball just simply does not uh, ricochet and gain momentum on this turf, artificial turf, like it does in some other ballparks. Now it is Wally Backman. Hits the ball to the shortstop Reynolds. Craig handles it, his throw across, pulls him off the bag. Error on the throw by Reynolds. Backman has speed, and he went hustling down the line, and the Mets have the first base runner of the series with Keith Hernandez coming to the plate. Well, once Craig Reynolds takes the step back to field the ball, he's back on his heels. Now when he plants, he takes a little bit too much time, and he makes a high throw, and Backman beats the throw. Once you take that step back, then you're beaten, especially with a guy who can run like Backman. Al Lanier. Passing some information onto the field. The coaches for New York. Bud Harrelson at third. Bill Robinson at first. And poison for a lot of ball clubs is at the plate. Keith Hernandez. See the numbers for Keith. He's also a rather patient fellow. He's walked 94 times this year. Struck out only 69 times. 
Fastball is popped in for a strike on Hernandez. As Backman, you see him getting off first base, at least going as far to hook one foot on the run. That's what Hal Lanier was worried about. When a, when a team's out on defense, the reason a manager would give signs, he's giving it to his catcher. You see Alan Ashby always looking at the dugout because Hal Lanier realizes the Mets run just like his ball club does. Scott's move to first is not bad. There's Hal giving those signs right there. He's giving those signs to Alan Ashby. And this would be an ideal spot in which to pitch out. That was close. And that's how good Scott's move can be. Look how close this was. Backman just in there. Nice quick tag by Glenn Davis. Whose work around the bag at first base has improved steadily. Too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One out. Backman again edging off, and Hernandez in with a strike on him. Backman goes, and Hernandez howls it back out of play. Wally wound it up pretty quick that time. He had a fair jump. And it was the hit and run, and you saw Lanier with the signs with Alan Ashby, and it really becomes a guessing game between the catcher and the hitter, or the catcher and manager tandem, and the hitter. Gary Carter is the man on deck. Two strike count on Keith Hernandez. Swing and a miss, and he struck him out. That did not look like the split finger. No, that was a high fastball. And you don't even often see Hernandez go for a pitch out of the strike zone. But you will notice that Dwight Gooden and Mike Scott with their fastballs are very, very effective up in the strike zone. Gooden's the same way. Now Gary Carter. He's been the big noise with 105 runs batted in and 24 home runs for the Mets this season. Strong had good rest while he was on injured on the injured list. And there's your split fingered fastball, just dove off the table, and Gary swung and missed it. Throws it just like his fastball, same motion, but he's got to come over the top of it to get it into the strike zone. Wally Backman on first, two down. Not quite as bold now. He's not out on the rug, and uh, Scott chases him back one more time. Daryl Strawberry waiting if Carter gets aboard. Backman will be less inclined to run right now because Carter not only has a right-handed hitter, and the catcher has a better view towards second base. He is not impeded by the runner at first, but also Carter's a power hitter. So Wally will probably allow Gary to hit in this situation as opposed to Hernandez when he had the hit and run on. Jose Cruz way back in left field for Carter. Hatcher deep in center. They move the fences in some here at the dome. The ball does crawl over it more often. Now Gary Carter wants him to look at the ball. I mean, that thing just exploded. Well, it really did. No sooner than Carter swung the bat, he turns around and asks Doug Harvey to check the ball. From a psychological standpoint, you don't know whether having him check the ball that quickly works to the advantage of the Mets or to the disadvantage of the Mets. They may be worrying about the wrong thing. Two-strike pitch. Swung on and missed strike three. So Mike Scott strikes out two of the four Mets he faces. New York leaves Buckman on first. And after a half inning of play, there is no score. And the controversy has already started over whether or not Scott's doing something to the ball. And as Tim McCarver says... It could be they're fussing about the wrong thing. 
We'll go now to the bottom of the first inning. For the Houston Astros, the New York Mets defensively will line up this way. In left field, Mookie Wilson, Lynn Dykstra center, Daryl Strawberry right. Inside, it's Keith Hernandez at first, Wally Backman second, Rafael Santana short, Ray Knight third, Gary Carter back at the plate, and Dwight Gooden on the mound with a record of 17 and 6, 2.84 earned run average, and he is the first major league pitcher in his first three seasons to strike out 200 or more in each season. His lifetime record is 58 and 19, and it's amazing that he is going against. Mike Scott tonight because Dwight Gooden his nickname is doctor and of course we've already seen that Scott has been accused of doctoring the ball already the umpires Doug Harvey back at the plate Lee Wire at first Frank Foley second Dutch win at third left field line is Joe West right side is Fred Brocklander Doug Harvey of course was the man involved in that now famous did he catch it or didn't he involving Vern Rule in the series of 1980 between uh, the Phillies and the Astros? Very complicated moment in the life of an umpire. Billy Hatcher, line drive hitter, very aggressive on the bases. And Dwight Gooden's first pitch is ball one. Hatcher has walked 22 times, struck out 52 times, so he's hacking when he comes up. High pop left side. Ray Knight coming over, and Ray can't get it. Ray Knight, of course, was a member of the Houston Astros organization before he went on to New York, and uh, at times it seemed he was going to blossom in Houston, but he never did. But he's a gamer. Let me tell you, he's a gamer. Well, they, an indication of his gamesmanship came out with the year he had this year after being written off by almost everybody. Hatcher tries to lay it down and can't get a piece of it and the count is one ball and two strikes. What a moment for a 21 year old. Huh? Dwight Good. Three years in the major leagues. He's already had two books and a rap record. That's a foul ball out of play. A rap record? A rap record. He has got a new album out, and he's backed up by Mellow Mel. I love it. Mellow Mel is the backup. <laughs> Here, not even 22 years old yet. He's talking about wedding next year, though. He'll be 22 in November this year. A one ball, two strike count to Billy Hatcher. Foul back. When it's working for him, a wicked, wicked curveball. Hatcher has not seen it yet. Dennis Mankey coaching at third, Matt Galati at first for Houston. Hatcher hits the ball to left field. In play. Curveball. Hatcher jumped on it, lifted it out to Bookie Wilson for out number one. That was not a good curveball. It was a curveball that was up, but it shows you how good he can get away with high curveballs because it's so unexpected when a hitter gets it. They've got to be geared for the fastball. Now it's Bill Doran. 81 times he walked this year. Struck out only 57 times. Punch foul left side out of play. He batted leadoff until mid-August, pulled a groin muscle. He came back to the lineup. He had a little trouble running, getting speed, really getting going. So uh, Hal Lanier moved Billy Hatcher into the leadoff spot, dropping Doran into the number two spot. Denny Walling is on deck, waiting for a chance. And Gooden is low and away. As Laurie. Pretty wife for Bill. Pitch is hot. Two balls, one strike. Give you some idea of the matchup you're looking at right now. A 
Lifted softly left field. Wilson coming in a hurry. He makes the catch. Two down. Now, Denny Wally, guy that's got a half a dozen gloves in his locker. He can play almost any place for you. He went on a tear, finished the season strong, batting 312 with 13 home runs and 58 runs batted in. And he's the most dangerous hitter in the Astro lineup against Gooden. With all due respect to Glenn Davis, who had 31 home runs, and he's on deck. Walling, a very, very smart hitter and rarely swings at the first pitch. And Dwight starts him with a slow curveball for a strike. That's the key to Walling. You've got to stay ahead of him because if you don't, he sits on that fastball and he doesn't foul it back. He hits it a long way. He has one home run this year against Good. Comes curve again. This one's high. Count even at one and one. Strawberry showing respect and right. He's well back. Fastball. Foul. Right side. Well, Denny showed right there. He was sitting on the heater. Denny and he fouled it, fouled it off because he had seen two curveballs first. That makes a, a fastball hitter think curveball. And then you can throw. It's not that you can't throw a fastball hitter a fastball. That's absurd. But... When you do it, you want to do it after showing him something else. In the process, you do run the danger of falling behind in the count, however. Two out, nobody on. One, two count on Wally. Fly ball, left field. Mookie Wilson uh, off a broken back fly ball. Makes the catch. So Mookie gets all three put outs in the bottom of the first inning. We played one at the Astrodome, and there is no score between the Mets and the Astros. The split fingered split -fingered fastball, fastball was part of the conversation I had with Mike Scott. Here's what he says about it It's the exact same motion as I use when I throw my fastball. I think that's why it's been so easy on my arm this year. I don't really, there's no tricks to it. It's exactly what the pitch says. I split my fingers and throw a fastball. Are you among the legion of pitchers, even though you've had a remarkable season, that, that that ball may be a little hotter this year than it has in times past? Well, I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, maybe I'm lucky that my fingers are the right size. or I think you have to throw hard, and I throw hard, so that makes the ball move a little bit more. But uh, it just was a real easy pitch for me to pick up after I talked to uh, Roger Craig. You know, we spent about 10 days and threw about seven, and after that I just basically got my arm in shape, threw it in spring training, and, it, and the pitch came around. And right now he's pitching to Daryl Strawberry to be followed by Mookie Wilson and Ray Knight. Strawberry in at 2.59 on the year, but with 93 runs batted in and 27 home runs. It's one ball and one strike on Daryl. Another interesting thing about Strawberry with that long stroke that he has, he did strike out 141 times this year. Yeah, with that long stroke, if he connects, he connects with a lot of power. Watch how he curls that bat from this angle. Just outside. Two balls and a strike. There was a conversation between Bill Robinson, the first base coach, and Doug Harvey, the plate umpire, as Robbie was on his way to first base. And undoubtedly, they were talking about it. That time, Scott comes with a breaking pitch and nails the inside corner, and it's two and two. Earlier in the year, as a matter of fact, Bill Robinson and Rick Roden of the Pittsburgh Pirates had a fight. Both benches emptied because they thought Roden was scuffing the ball. Struck him out. He looks tough. Well, this is not a split finger here. This is a tailing fastball. Now, watch how it starts out inside and then comes back to catch the inside corner. See that little tail on the end? And Gooden, a lot of left-handers give up on that pitch because of the late action on the fastball. Now it's Mookie Wilson. Now back. He jumped on the fastball on the first pitch. Mookie at 289.
Good solid baseball player, this fellow. Inside. He was moved from center to left field, as many of you in the New York area or those who follow the Mets know well. He didn't say anything about it, went over did the best he could because they needed to make some room for Dykstra. That shot foul. And it almost picked off somebody in the photographer's pin down there. But Mook has been all over the lineup this year. He's been one, two, five, six, seven. And he just came, checked the lineup, and went to work. High fastball struck him out. Scott now has struck out four in a row. That will tie a league championship record of Milt Wilcox in striking out four successive batters. Well, if he keeps throwing like that, he's going to break a lot of records tonight. Two games ago, he threw a no-hitter, and then the next game, he threw six innings against the same ball club, the San Francisco Giants. Fifteen and two-thirds consecutive, in consecutive innings of no-hit ball. He is throwing some gas tonight, I'm telling you. Ray Knight at the plate. Foul ball, right side. Ray Knight is one of those who gives the split finger business little thought. He just looks for a pitch he can hit. That may be the best way to approach it. Go worrying about it. You've just added your burden. Lifted to center. Hatcher coming, 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 coming. Makes the catch. So Mike Scott retires the New York Mets in order in the top of the second inning. And after an inning and a half in the Astrodome. There is no score, and you can see here that was a dying quail hit out in the center, and Hatcher had a long way to come to get it. But he did it. Now the hammer throwers in the Houston batting order as Dwight Gooden comes high and tight to Glenn Davis, who had 31 home runs and 101 runs batted in for Houston this year. Kevin Bass will follow, and then Jose Cruz. High fly ball, deep center field. Dykstra going back, back to the wall. It's gone. He awesome. put it right in his wheelhouse. He threw the best pitch that Dwight Gooden can throw, a high fastball. You talk about power to power. It's an old cliche, but applies here. This ball has hit a ton to center field. It went out of here at about 399 feet. And it's one nothing Houston with Kevin Bass coming to the plate. Tell you what a great story Glenn Davis is. Suicidal tendencies as a teenager, taken in by the parents of Storm Davis, the pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles. Which makes him obviously Storm's stepbrother. Also playing with a plate and screws in his uh, right arm from yep. a high school football injury, but he's settled in and is on his way to start him. Is he ever? Kevin Bass, another bright star for these Houston Astros, stands in and takes a pitch whistled in from Dwight Gooden for a strike. Switch hitter, his best power side is the right side. But he's quite strong, has good bat speed, and he's got good foot speed. There is no substitute for foot speed. I don't care what your sport is. That's fouled away. 
Only as pardon me, Keith, only asset in baseball that you can use offensively and defensively. Of course, the remaining fact about baseball is in this game, you've got to win your way into the championship series or World Series. There are no at-large appointments in this game. Almost nailed it. Well, you saw the first pitch just to Glenn Davis, and now the 0-1 pitch, or make that the 0-2 pitch to Kevin Bass. Now, the one thing noticeable about Gooden this year is he has been coming in on hitters more than in the past couple of years. That pitch had a purpose. Just low. They appeal. Third base umpire says no. Dutch winner. A lot of wisdom there between home plate and third base in those two umpires. <laughs> Logged a few years together. Ball is bounced, foul down the first base side. So the count holds at two balls and two strikes with Jose Cruz. I think one of the least known stars of today's baseball generation. Man has had a brilliant career. Getting up into the 30s now and probably not too many years left. But he has had a great career here with the Houston Astros from Puerto Rico. And the pitch is outside to Kevin Bass. And now it's a full count. The first we've had in the game. Three and two. Glenn Davis home run giving Houston the lead one to nothing. Shot down the right side going to the corner. Could be extra bases. Bass turns first. Well played by Strawberry in the corner, and it's a double for Bass. So a home run and a double by the first two men to face Dwight Gooden here in the home half of the second inning. Well, a 3-2 count. You notice how Hernandez plays off the line. He plays all hitters off the line because he figures that balls down the line are doubles or extra base hits. It's up to the pitcher and catcher to keep the ball away from the lines. And now Cruz will go with the pitch wherever it is. Swings through the fastball and misses and that was in about the same location where Davis lost it. Yeah, this is one of those overrated situations in baseball where you say you've got a left-handed pull hitter with nobody out and a runner on second base and you ought to give yourself up to get him over. I'd rather have a guy swinging the bat as well as Cruz try to get him in, not get him over. He unwound on that one, and he goes that way again. It's a looping fly ball to center field. Dexter comes in a hurry, and Bass has to go back to second base. Again, the speed of Dexter coming to play on that soft little fly ball looped out into center. Jose Cruz is in the position where he's one of the RBI men. And with a guy like Cruz, you don't want him getting a guy over for the bottom part of the order. If it's Wally Backman getting a runner over for Keith Hernandez, or one of the one, two, and table setter type hitters for the middle three, well, that's a different story, but not in that situation. Alan Ashby, the catcher, 245 average. He's a switch hitter. And Dwight Gooden starts him with a curveball. And again, this is a hitter where you want to change speeds on him, keep him off balance. He will sit on the fastball. Another curve, and good for a strike. So it's two strikes on Ashby. Pesky hitters down at the bottom of the Houston order. High, high, high. 
by Goodman. Kevin Bass is on second base. You've got one out. You've got to run across. Craig Reynolds, the shortstop, swinging about in the on deck circle. Way up with that one. Well, he got two strikes with the curveballs. I would imagine he'll go back to a curveball on this count. Because you do have first base open, and if you throw two curveballs and miss, then you have your eighth place hitter up. He shook off one pitch. We'll see. Turned it over. And it's inside. And he might throw another curveball here. Three and two to Ashby. Ashby does sit on the fastball, and you saw what Bass did on the three-two fastball. And with first base open, even though it's the early innings, and you don't want to get too many base runners on, I think you might see the breaking ball again. Yep. Ball four. And now comes Craig Reynolds, one of those six that endured and persevered and came up just short in 1980. This guy can be dangerous, though. He beat Roger McDowell, one of only four players to hit a home runs off the sinking ball or relief specialist with the Mets. Beat him in a home run, and that was the game that Gooden and Scott had worked. Scott carried a four to nothing lead into the ninth inning, the only time those two have faced each other this year, and Reynolds won it in the bottom of the ninth with a homer off McDowell. And he'll have a rip. He'll have a rip if it's a fastball. Shot down the right side, just foul. He jumped if, all over it, didn't he? Yeah, if you're saying these guys are fastball hitters, you're right. You're exactly right. But what are you going to do with Dwight Good throwing lollipop change-ups or something? I mean, this is, you know, fastball against a fastball hitting club. And you got to throw it sometimes. And with Dwight Good, you can throw it any time. The thing is, when you throw it, you want to be ahead in the count because when you're ahead in the count, that eliminates a lot from a hitter's standpoint. He becomes a defensive hitter instead of an offensive hitter, and there's a big, big difference. One strike pitch is high and away. Well, Glenn Davis said it yesterday and talking about good, and he said, if he makes a mistake, normally it'll be with a curveball. Because if he makes a mistake with his fastball, it's coming so fast you can't hit it anyhow. <laughs> but he did, didn't he? He certainly did. It's like saying some one of the Mets is a split finger fastball hitter, and and you don't want to throw it if you're Mike Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no way, you throw that to anybody with a stick in his hand. A one ball and one strike count on Reynolds with Bass at second base and Ashby at first base. One run is in. You got one out. The pitcher Scott waiting on deck and Gooden is high and away. So you see how this pattern's going. 3 2 double by Bass behind in the count. The 1 0 fastball hit by Davis to center field and now it's 2 1 to Reynolds. It's not whether to throw the fastball or not, but how you stay ahead in the count. Because these guys, when they get a fastball behind in the count, they're looking for it. And when you're looking for it, it's like batting practice, even if you throw as hard as Gooden does. Two one pitch. Change, soft curve, broke it nicely over the inside corner. It's two balls and two strikes. Well, there's your difference there, I think, in the maturity of Dwight Gooden. He's pitching instead of throwing. He's been doing that since he was 19 years old, throwing curveballs behind in the count, and that was a mighty, mighty big pitch right there.
Ball is hit softly into right field. Strawberry comes, drops in front of him. Bass may not be able to come home. He has to hold because he didn't know whether or not Strawberry would be able to run it down. So the little looper drops in front of Strawberry. The bases are loaded. You've got one out and the pitcher, Mike Scott, coming to the plate. Now, Mike Scott had 12 hits and 95 at-bats on the season. He struck out 48 times. And the last time I said that a pitcher didn't represent any particular threat at the plate, Steve Carlton had a three-run home run in St. Louis this past <laughs> season. <laughs> I don't know, with the speed of Bass at third, does uh, Scott put it on the ground? Well, not only put it on the ground, you might think about a sacrifice here. Usually situations like this are relegated for later innings, but with Scott throwing as well as he's been throwing, I wouldn't at all rule out the possibility of a sacrifice. And there's Hal in there, and we'll see. Well, it'll be an all-out squeeze because the folks are all over the bases, and Bass now starts creeping down the line at third. Dennis Mickey, the third base coach for Houston. Quite good enough to his armpits in trouble right here with one out. One run in. Strike one. See, Dennis Minky, the third base coach, very close to Kevin Bass. And the reason he's down there that close is a lot of times on the squeeze play, a word sign has to be relayed to the runner at third to make the hitter sure that he has gotten the sign. Check swing. Strike. They appeal it. First base umpire Lee Wire said yes, he went through the zone. It's two strikes on Mike Scott. Now you can't, for the most part, forget about the squeeze unless he gets a couple of three balls on him. Mike goes too far on this curveball. A good play by Carter on the short hop. Little difference here with a pitcher at the plate, whereas in the American League you have the DH. How true. Swings and misses and strikes out. That is the first strikeout for Dwight Gooden in the ball game. You've got two out now. The bases are still loaded, and here's the top of the order, Billy Hatcher. A lot surely has happened early, Henry. Yes, sir. <laughs> One pitcher has been dominant so far. The other pitcher has struggled some. But it's still only a one-run ball game. Hatcher hit a fly ball to left field. Mookie Wilson caught it for the first out of the ball game. His first time up. And that pitch is low and away, and Gary Carter boxes it around and contains it. That was a good play by Gary. Catchers are more apt to catch the breaking ball in the dirt. It's the fastball in the dirt that gets them in trouble. Breaking ball in the dirt is going down, and as a catcher, you anticipate the ball in the dirt. That pitch is on the outside corner and good for a call strike. That was just pure heat. Bill Doran is on deck. High pop right side coming back and out of play. This is a ballpark that's tailor-made for the line drive hitters, and the Houston lineup is loaded with them, including the fellow at the state, Billy Hatcher. It's a favorable graphic for the Houston Astros, isn't it? Spells pitching, for one thing. Hatcher swings and hits another one to the right side, and it's going to curl back into the crowd out of play. Be at second, and Reynolds at first. And the count is one ball and two strikes on Billy Hatcher with two down.
Third baseman Ray Knight steps on the bag, getting the force at third and the third out of the inning. So Gooden struggles some. The Houston Astros break through and score on Glenn Davis's home run and lead after two, one to nothing. Now for the New York Mets. As we go to the top of the third inning, it'll be Rafael Santana, Dwight Gooden, and then the top of the order, Lynn Dykstra. Santana, the shortstop, takes a strike from Mike Scott with a batting average of 218. Glove is so good they can tolerate a 218 average. Strike two. Boy, Scott's got his neck bowed, doesn't he? He's coming He's right at him. He's got his fingers bowed, too. <laughs> Foul back. The, the irony of Roger Craig teaching Mike Scott the uh, split fingered fastball, of course, is it's against San Francisco that he nails uh, his no hitter. Yeah. And clincher. Oh, great play by Billy Dora. Oh, this is just a marvelous play by a marvelous player. This ball is scorched to toward the gap. And watch Doran. Oh, that's a full extension. It's like Greg Luganis going after that ball. Boy, that is a fine play by Doran. You don't hear anything but superlatives about him from the opposition. Because he's been making plays like that ever since he became an Astro. Now the Mets pitcher Dwight Gooden. Who has seven hits and 81 at bats. This year. But he only struck out 16 times. So it must mean that he does make some contact with the ball. He will talk to anybody in the world about his hitting. <laughs> anybody who will listen. He loves to talk about hitting. And would prefer to bat left-handed, but the Mets management with that no right way. arm of his, no way he's going to expose it. Strike two. As we mentioned, contemplating the fact that his schedule. I shouldn't say he's contemplating. It is scheduled. The wedding in November. Colleen Pearson, his high school sweetheart. They'll wed in Tampa. That's fouled away to the right. They're going to be wed November 15th, and Carlene's birthday is November 13th, and Dwight's birthday is November 16th. And so they're sandwiching that. They met in church back in 1982. Pitch is just outside as he snapped the slider off and missed with it. It's fun to see young men like Dwight Gooden who goes home. When the season is done, he puts on his overalls, relaxes, and then he goes back into his training regimen and gets ready to go back to work. And he swings and misses, striking out. So that is five strikeouts now for Mike Scott. Well, Dwight's not going to put his overalls on after this, but he's going to go home with that fastball. <laughs> I'll tell you. Great Scott, he has been that this year. Certainly the front runner for the Cy Young Award. You have Fernando Valenzuela also with 21 wins. Lynn Mike Dykstra Kruger. bounced out to the first baseman on the first pitch of the ball game. One of the thing about things about this fellow Scott, though, as we noted early before we came on the air, we were perusing through the the stats. Bouncing ball out to the second baseman Doran. He throws out Dykstra for his tire of the side. But eight of the ten losses by Mike Scott this year were by one run. One nothing Houston. The Astrodome is full in Houston, with their team leading one to nothing. The crowd now relatively quiet, but it may pick up its tempo any moment, and its decibel count will rise as Bill Doran, Denny Walling, and Glenn Davis come to the plate. Doran, born and raised and lives in Cincinnati, coming up through the minors in the 80s, they knew this young man was going to be a player for them. 
They went ahead and traded Johnny Ray, if you remember, to the Pittsburgh Pirates back in 1981. Got Phil Garner. A lot of people were carping about it, but Phil Garner turned out to be a very valuable member of this Houston infield as well, and Doran is going to be a big star. He had a fly ball to left field his first time up. He is 0 for 1. Houston's run came on a 400-foot home run by Glenn Davis, and he is the number three hitter scheduled in this inning. And Dwight Gooden now goes to two balls and no strikes to Doran. That's just low. Davis homered, Bass doubled, Gooden walked Ashby, Reynolds a soft single. Houston stranded three. Back in the second inning. There's a strike, three and one. Both teams came into this series on a five-game winning streak. Doran pulls it foul down the right side. The Astros won 15 of their last 19, and the Mets won 11 of their last 13. So both came in on an up note. Mind you, the 1969 season, the first year of divisional play, when the Mets and the Atlanta Braves met each other, both having nine-game winning streaks. 3-2 pitch. Sharply down the right side. Great play, Hernandez. Gooden covers it, and Hernandez throws him out. Is there anybody better over no, there? No, no. I've never seen anybody better. Watch this play by Hernandez. He's playing him the same place he was playing Kevin Bass. Great extension. Now he throws from his knees. State-of-the-art first baseman. Yes, sir. Now Denny Wally. 0 for 1. And that's upstairs. Not only does Hernandez, by playing off the line, make plays like that, but by playing off the line, he allows Wally Backman, who is weaker going to his right, to play closer to second base. That ball is hit sharply. Hernandez gloves it and throws to Good. So that three to one combination is good for two outs. Here in the bottom of the third inning. Now it is Davis. Crowd comes up for it. Glenn Davis with a home run at 400 feet in the second inning. I guess the most consistent long ball threat the Astros have had since the toy cannon played here. Jimmy Wynn. Several guys in the league that can small up their own ballpark. And this guy's one of them. 17 home runs in this park this year. That's a shot down the left side. Great play. Ray Knight. Throw. Got him. Two fielding gins in the inning on the corners by the Mets. One by Hernandez and one by Knight. And the Astros hit the ball sharply off Gooden. But they are turned away in order. And after three, it's one nothing, Houston. It's our pleasure to visit for a moment with the Vice President of the United States, to George Bush. And I knew that if they were having a championship series in Houston, you were going to come. Hometown. Hometown. <laughs> And what a thrill for this city and great ball game so far. Impressed by this fellow Scott? Scott, stronger and stronger. He's throwing harder and harder, it looks to me like, but he, he mixes it up too. How did you guys time. lose twice to California teams in the uh, College World Series? <laughs> we managed to do it. They were tough, though. They had Jackie Jensen and a couple like that in the old days, though. Long time ago. It's a, you know, that's fun, though, to have played in the first College World Series, wasn't it? Yeah, first two. I played in 47 and 48. And now the colleges of the nation are becoming kind of a farm system for major leagues. You know, more and more players are more coming on. Yeah, look at the Red Sox pitcher out of the University of Texas. You going to go to the football game, the OU Texas games? Going you know, to miss it. Miss it, I'm afraid. Oh, that's too bad. That's always a grand time. Good to see you. Thanks Mr. a lot. Vice President, thank you. Good to be with you. Vice President George Bush, we go now to the top of the fourth inning. 
And Mike Scott, who has just been utterly dominant so far in the ball game, pitching to Wally Backman, Keith Hernandez, and Gary Carter. They're throwing pitches, Mr. Vice President, that uh, they didn't have when uh, we were out there hacking away. <laughs> <laughs> Lifted out to left field for Jose Cruz. And he makes the catch for out number one. Thank you, sir. Now Keith Hernandez walking to the plate. Mike Scott has thrown 31 pitches and 26 strikes so far. Wow. That is a wow. <laughs> that is a wow. <laughs> mm. Gary Carter is the third man scheduled to come in this inning. Houston leading one to nothing. Uh, here's the matchup between Hernandez and Scott. No other player in the National League has as many as three home runs against Mike Scott. And Hernandez has five. That's a base hit. The first one in the ball game for the New York Mets. And he just roped it into right field. Well, the 1-0 count again. Mike Scott, I say again, again, a situation in which a pitcher has fallen behind. And it seems to be that that's the way you've got to treat both of these pitches, pitchers. Hope they get behind in the count, look for a pitch, and then try to nail it. So here's a threat at the plate now. Long ball threat in Gary Carter. Struck out his first time, as did Hernandez his first time. But now Keith has hit a single in the right, and Carter stands in. And Scott drills him with a strike. Foul back, and Gary had his cut. He had a fastball up and didn't get it. Well, he's not going to get that pitch again either. He's going to get split finger fastballs, especially the way Gary reacted to those pitches his first time up. Scott ahead, two strikes. Hernandez off first, one out. Pitch inside and low. That was the same pitch that Carter struck out on the first time up. You know the amazing thing, Keith, about, about Mike Scott? He's only thrown three wild pitches all year, which says something about Alan Ashby and the job he's done behind the plate. Swing and a miss by Carter. Two down. That's six strikeouts now for Scott. Well, this pitch is just unhittable. The split finger fastball. Now watch it drop. Daryl Strawberry. With two down and Keith Hernandez on first base in the top of the fourth inning. And it's outside. The six strikeouts, five have been swinging and one call. The one caught looking was Strawberry. Tell you, the Mets complaining about the illegal pitch that Scott's been throwing. They ought to complain about the legal one. <laughs> That's a split finger fastball. <laughs> Bouncer to the second baseman, Doran. Flip over to second baseman to Reynolds for the force on Hernandez coming down, and the side is retired. But the Mets pick up their first hit of the ball game. In the middle of the fourth, it's one nothing Astros. 8 o'clock tomorrow night, Eastern Time, here on AB7, ABC 7 Central. We'll have game number two of the National League Championship Series. Starting pitchers will be Ojeda 
18 and 5 for the Mets and Nolan Ryan 12 and 8 for the Astros and that'll be at 8 Eastern with the uh, game number 3 between the Boston Red Sox and California Angels in the American League Championship Series coming up on Friday night at the same time Al Michaels and Jim Palmer and all of our guys and the two teams traveling from Boston to the West tomorrow well that thing turned around in a hurry in Boston today didn't it nine to two the Red Sox over the California Angels some errant play on the defense by the Angels Kevin Bass is at the plate to be followed by Jose Cruz and Alan Ashby for Houston as we work now in the bottom of the fourth inning with the Astros leading on Glenn Davis home run one to nothing On the inside corner, Gooden's tough inning was the second. He had the bases loaded with one out, having given up a home run and a double, and worked himself out of the jam as the Astros stranded three. Ball is bounced to Keith Hernandez, and another good play by the Mets' first baseman for out number one. And the sound you're hearing in the background is for Jose Cruz. Breaking pitch for ball one. Jose is now 39 years of age. And he's not only played it for the Astros for the last 12 years, he's played winter ball 16 straight years. He's played year-round for 16 straight years. Ball is punched to left field for a base hit. One hop to Mookie Wilson, and Cruz is aboard. That's base hit number four for Houston. Fastball outside part of the plate, and you see that inimitable style of Jose Cruz. And if he were playing in a big media center like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, oh. his name would be from coast to coast. His truck would have chrome wheels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alan Ashby at the plate now with one out. Shot to right, base hit, Cruz turns at second, Strawberry picks it up in a hurry and whips it back in. Back-to-back -back singles now, Cruz stopping at second, Aspie's on first. And Craig Reynolds coming to the plate, while Gary Carter and company go to the mound to have a visit. Mel Stottlemyre is standing there with Davey Johnson. Mel, of course, great pitcher for the Yankees in his playing days. And David Johnson has all the confidence in the world. He let Stottlemyre handle that staff. What about good? You know him, Tim, as well as anybody. His problems this year? Well, they're a combination of a lot of things. His third year in the league, a lot of the hitters are laying off the pitch that's a ball, the high fastball. And Gooden has talked about trying to carry the load earlier in the year he got his mechanics messed up he started striding too far runners take an edge and the pitch to Craig Reynolds is foul back and he jumped on that fastball again I think a lot of baseball people when they talk about a pitcher overthrowing what they really mean is that he's over striding consequently not getting on top of the ball you hear that expression so many times that certainly was one of the problems this year. Early wildness in the count and counts, which he has shown tonight, and yet he trails only one to nothing. Cruz off second, Ashby off first. Pitch is looped down the left side, drops foul. Right off the hand. And it was fouled by a good six, seven feet. 
With the left-handed batter at the plate, Hernandez, with one out, is well back down the line at first. And that enables Ashby to get the big lead. I mean, he's way up on the carpet at first base. Well, catchers need big leads. They <laughs> <laughs> ought to put that base about 10 feet out for catchers. They need big leads. Ought to give you a handicap. Huh? <laughs> of some kind. <laughs> Two strikes on Reynolds with Scott on deck. Punch to the left side, base hit in the left field. Here comes Cruz around third, and Mankey holds him. As Mookie Wilson comes in a hurry, respecting Wilson's arm, there was no threat to send Cruz home. The bases are loaded once again for the Houston pitcher, Mike Scott. Back of the second inning. With one out, the base is loaded. He could have helped himself mightily. Here's the base hit now in the left. Re Reynolds just poking that ball to left field. Ray Knight didn't pick that ball up. You saw him move back toward the bag. He didn't pick that ball up real well. And now Mike Scott is going to talk to Dennis Minky, the third base coach. And... If you were thinking about a squeeze play in the second inning, the fact that Scott struck out swinging on three straight pitches and Billy Hatcher went down might be an indication that the squeeze certainly, there's no other reason for Minke to be talking nope. to Mike Scott. That's right, and the New York Mets now have had a conference at the mound with all of the infielders, and they're undoubtedly thinking along the same highway. And, and this is how a squeeze sign is delivered. The coach gives it to the batter. The batter does something unusual, like looks back if he's not used to looking back, and then that relays it back to the coach, and the word sign goes to the runner. Sounds complicated, but it happens in a split second. Hernandez is poised to come at first. Scott swings and fouls it back. The speed of the runner at third base is insignificant in a speed uh, in a squeeze play. As a matter of fact, Eddie Stanky used to tell us when he was training us about what to do on a squeeze to take one step back toward third to prevent from breaking too soon. Scott swung away at the first pitch. And now Gooden bluffs Cruz back toward third. Jose is not the Jose of a few years ago in foot speed either. And he has had, uh, had arthroscopy earlier uh -huh. this year. Mm -hmm. Comes down the line. The pitch to Scott. Lifted right side. Foul and into the crowd. And Gooden has the edge of two strikes on Mike Scott. Well, he's certainly been in position in successive at-bats to really help himself, hasn't he? He certainly has. That might spur him to spend a little more time in the cage in the spring. <laughs> Two strike pitch to Scott. Bounced to the shortstop. Second for one, back to first. They get the double play, and once again, Gooden dodges a bullet. As in the second inning, and now in the fourth inning, the Astros have the bases loaded with one out and can't break through against him. So after four, it is still Houston one and the Mets nothing. When the Houston franchise started playing the National League, Judge Roy Hoffheitz wanted his players to be spiffy on the road, so he arranged them in special uniforms, and Joey Amalfitano, one of the original, remembers. We used to all dress in these Western tailor-made suits. They were very nice, but here you see a group of 30 people coming through an airport, and <laughs> here they come. <laughs> so at one time, I remember going through the old hair airport in Chicago and I hadn't had it on I had received permission not to wear it that day because I had an appointment in Chicago and someone came up to me and asked me who these guys were and I said they were an ice skating team from Houston Texas <laughs> which was not the truth <laughs> there were trying times but uh, the Astros trying times were not as trying as the Mets were 
That's right. 1962 Mets lost 120 games. But speaking of the uniforms nowadays, Tony Kornheiser of the Washington Post says that the uniforms the Astros wear this year look like that something was spilled in third place at a kindergarten arts fair. <laughs> well, they're going to go. They'll satisfy the uh, the sartorial appetites by going to plain whites at home and light blues on the road. They're going back to the old classic uh, uniform next year. And not to Washington. And not to Washington. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Mookie Wilson, Ray Knight, and Rafael Santana. Are the scheduled hitters for the Mets in the top of the fifth inning. Mike Scott bowling along, having given one hit so far. The Astros have picked up six off Dwight Gooden. And Wilson jammed a little bit, whips it back foul. So it's two strikes on Mookie. Scott, when he pitched his no-hitter, got a $5,000 bonus from the ball club, and he gave the money to the Texas Children's Hospital, saying simply they needed more than... I do. Fouled again to the left side. I think it's a classy ball club myself. Classy people on this ball club in many, many ways. Pitch is outside, and it's one and two now to Mookie. They were classy before, but the difference this year, they've been classy and good. Yep. Now it's two balls and two strikes. Wilson leading off for New York in the top of the fifth inning. Up the middle, flag by Scott. Helps himself defensively there, and you've got one out. Well, he had to make the play to get Wilson. Yep, if that ball gets through, then you have Reynolds making a very difficult play because there's not too many guys in the National League that get down to first base from the left side faster than Wilson. The one thing that a, a pitching coach hates to see is anywhere... Anytime you put that bare hand near a ball coming back, especially on the artificial surface, because that ball has such overspin that it can just slice up that right hand. Ray Knight hits it long and deep down the left side, but we foul. That's an upper decker. Yeah. Holy cow. That would have been a home run in a, long, in a round park. <laughs> Ray, of course, uh, the husband of Nancy. Lopez Knight. Outside with that pitch. I would imagine, in fact, Ray confirmed that they have some interesting conversations in talking about the mechanics of the swings in their respective sport, of course. Nancy, the brilliant lady golfer. And uh, there, there are different mechanics, but still at the same time, there are some similarities as well. It's one ball and two strikes now. The mayor of Houston, Kathy Whitmire, enjoying what's happening in her city right now. And if the Astros beat the Mets in this four out of seven series, Kathy's picture will adorn the backdrop on the David Letterman show. <laughs> Swing and a miss. And that's strikeout number seven for Mike Scott. Two down for the Mets. And it's Rafael Santana. Over the top. And the over the top swing is what you get a lot of times when you're trying to hit that split finger fastball because it goes down so dramatically. That shot sharply to left. One bounce to Cruz. And Santana, who had scorched a, a liner that Doran made a great play on his first time up, nailed this one sharply. Actually, he's had more wood on the ball, I think, than anybody in the batting order. Hit the ball hard in that nice play, as you said, by Doran the first time. And now the base hit to left that was hit very well. Two hits off Scott. And here's Dwight Gooden. 
Right one of the seven strikeouts for Scott so far. Who knows? Maybe Santana is will be the Mets Walter Mitty. Swing and a miss by Goodman. And Gooden leveled on that one. Strike two. Doug Harvey will check it as it ricocheted off the plate. Fisted to the right side for Doran. Flips it over to Davis, and the side is retired. So the Mets get their second hit, strand their third man of the ball game, and trail one to nothing. We move now to the bottom of the fifth inning in the opening game of the National League Championship Series for 1986. Houston Astros are leading one to nothing over the New York Mets at the top of the order for Houston. Billy Hatcher, Bill Doran, and Danny Walling. Dwight Gooden has had two innings of struggle. The second and the fourth. Breaking pitch is too high. Hal Lanier, the manager of these Astros, his rookie season, came here. He had a ball club, literally, that was moving base to base. But he had just finished five years with Whitey Herzog. And he brought a lot of Whitey's philosophy with it. Al Lanier, of course, the son of Max Lanier, who pitched in a couple of World Series in the 40s. Left-hander. Gooden now goes to three balls and no strikes. Well, with the exception of the first and third innings, Dwight's pattern has been to fall behind the first hitter. And that is a dangerous pattern that eventually catches up to you. He has the pitch on the outside corner, and that was on the black. It wasn't anywhere near the heart of the plate, but he got the call from Doug Harvey. You might see Hatcher take another pitch, because the 3-2 pitch is going to be the same as the 3-1. Outside, ball four. That's the uh, second walk given by Gooden. Now it's Bill Doran who has a good look down at third to the coach Dennis Menke. A lot of the scouts confirmed the fact that Gooden ranks toward the bottom ten or so in the National League and holding runners on. Well, that's a point that David Johnson made in the pregame show. Both staffs are get it to the plate slowly. Gooden fires over to first to keep him there. Now, if you you go to this clock in baseball thrives on numbers. <laughs> no question about it. But uh, his delivery to the plate clocked at about 164 with a runner on first base. 1-8 with a runner on second. Most pitchers will fall into that category of 1-3-1-4. So he's a little slow getting it up there. But in the process of learning the art of pitching he is going more and more to the bag to hold that runner as close as he can. Well, after his first year, he went down to Florida. As you take a look at Hernandez. And he went down and worked on that move. And it's the old Don Drysdale Dodger move. And it's technically a balk where they put weight on the left leg and then throw to first. They pitch out on Hatcher. And Hatcher is not going. I tell you, you don't, you don't often see that. Two throws to first base and then the pitch out. So a new wrinkle in pitching out. More often than not, if you throw to first base, you're not going to pitch out because the reason you throw to first base is to get the runner back toward first. At your back on his tummy. Of course, at the same time, that base runner lulled by the norm 
might be True. thinking he's thrown over here twice. Now he's going to go to the plate, and I'm going to go to second. He was low by something then. You could see the weight on the right foot. He was gone. And a very close throw and a quick tag by Hernandez, but he appeared to be in there. Ball one count to Bill Dora. Denny Walling is on deck. Houston leading one to nothing. Batting in the bottom of the fifth inning. And Gooden continues to chase Hatcher at first base. The conservative approach right now would be to bunt and not let Hatcher run. But Hal Lanier does not play that way. He'll give Hatcher a chance to steal second and then let Doran hit away. If he's thrown out, he could do the same thing with Doran. See, Hatcher's got a couple of gloves in his hand. Well, that's it's cushion for that hand. You like to have something in a hand when you go sliding into the bag. To keep the hand closed and not open. Right. Don't beat up the fingers. He goes. Pitches inside. Carter's throw. Bounces off Hatcher and rolls out him behind the shortstop's position. So Hatcher steals second base. And he stole second base on as good a throw as you'll see. Gary Carter on a very difficult chance. Watch how he has to go inside for the pitch. And a quick release, and the ball arrives with Hatcher. I mean, that ball is right on the money. But that's how quick Hatcher is, and that's how good a jump he had. Boom. Against Gooden. In three years, that's now 106 stolen bases. 19 have been caught. Those are heavy numbers. Now, Doran has a chance to drive the ball. Two balls and no strike count on him. Hits it hard, but foul. Down the right side, and he got all of it. See, the whole key is getting ahead of the hitters. If we're, you remember back in the second inning, the double by Bass, the home run by Glenn Davis, the 1-0 pitch and the 3-2 pitch, and now the 2-0 pitch, you're going to get a lot of balls hit hard if you continue to fall behind, and that's what Gooden has done. Hatcher creeping off second. Ball is bounced to the right side to Hernandez, who will do it himself, and Doran moves the runner over to third. Now with one out, here is Denny Walling with a chance to deliver Houston's second run of the ball game. Glenn Davis now moves into the on-deck circle. Dwight Gooden struggled in the second, struggled in the fourth. Houston had the bases loaded in both innings with one out. But they couldn't break through against him. Now they've got a runner at third with the infield up. And one out, and Walling takes a curveball on the inside corner for a strike and doesn't like it. With Walling's power and being a line drive hitter with the infield in, it's advantage Walling. Batting average goes up 100 points in, the, in these situations. Fouled away to the left side. And in this particular matchup, it's advantage Gooden with two strikes. While Dwight rubs the new baseball, let's pause five seconds so our local stations can tell you who they are. Two strike pitch coming now to Denny Wallet.
fisted foul on the third base side. He that, really jammed him. Yeah, that was the pitch Gooden and Carter wanted right there, but the good hitters foul pitches like that off. It's very frustrating when you get a hitter to a situation where if you make that good pitch, you're going to get him out, and then he fouls it off, and that's what Walling did then. They may come right back in there. But again, the difference when a when a hitter is on the defensive, it's 0-2 as opposed to 2-0. and Punches it on the ground. Shortstop has it. Throw to the plate. And Hatcher is out. Out number two and down at first base, Walling on the fielder's choice. So the drawn-in infield in this instant pays off. Good play by Santana. Hatcher off on contact. He did not really have a good jump. If you, if the infield's in, regardless of your speed, you've got to make sure you cheat somewhere. And usually that's getting the good jump off a third. He didn't, and it's academic. This never hurts catchers. This is no problem. Watch how Carter just prepares himself for the collision. He really never touched him. You don't have to. <laughs> Two down. The only one in the game, a leadoff home run of the second inning at 400 feet by Glenn Davis. And Davis is at the plate right now with Walling on first base. And the pitch is outside. Keith, you've got to wonder if the Houston Astros continue to squander these runners at third and less than two outs. Yep. They are playing against a very explosive offensive team, regardless of who's pitching. Scott has been in control so far, but you squander chances to score, and things like that can catch up to you. Low and away again, and Carter comes up with it out of the dirt. The line score... The Mets, no runs, two hits, and no errors. The Astros, one run, six hits, and one error. And Houston so far has stranded four in the ball game. It was a double play turned by the Mets that got him out of trouble in the fourth inning. Curveball, dandy, in for a strike, it's two and one. He was not going to challenge Davis with that 2-0 fastball, but now after throwing the breaking ball, I wouldn't be surprised to see him come back with a fastball. Token throw to first. That's a courtesy toss right there. Walling's not going anywhere, not with Davis up. Ahead in the count, you want your big gunner to... Go to hacking. Let her rip. Fisted in the air to right center where Strawberry makes the catch for the third out. And so once again, Dwight Gooden escapes. It's 1-0 Houston back after this word. There's your line score in the ball game as we move along to the top of the sixth inning for the New York Mets and Lynn Dykstra, Wally Backman, and Keith Hernandez against Mike Scott. The Mets have two hits. They got their first hit in the fourth inning by Hernandez. The second hit was a solid single to left by Rafael Santana. Dykstra is 0 for 2. Slides up that bat handle, showing bunt. And he will put it down because he does have good speed. He also has a tendency sometimes, or likes to, take a whack at it. Slide the hands up the bat and then punch it. Slap at it. Got that third baseman creeping in. Denny Walling coming down the line at third. And Mike Scott now goes to two balls and no strikes. And that's what he did then. He was going to move up and then take a hack at it. But I'll tell you, he was out of the batter's box when he did it. Lynn Dykstra with those constantly moving fingers on the bat. Check him out. Two and one as the fastball is in for the strike. Doug Harvey telling Davey Johnson he ducked under it. Check out these fingers now. Three and one. 
They're nervous fingers, aren't they? Mm -hmm. His feet got a little wiggle in them, too. <laughs> He's busy. We talk about gamers. Here's a gamer. Here's somebody that a lot of people probably didn't even think would have ever have a chance. He just got a got his chance and just fought his way all the way to the big leagues and uh, a very substantial member of these New York Mets. Three and two now. First full count in the ball game for Mike Scott. The first one, and we are in the top of the sixth inning. Foul, out of play. Matter of fact, a lot of New York Met fans consider Dykstra number four and Backman number six to be a perfect ten. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, arguably, the, that package of Dykstra and Backman more valuable than any other single member on the Mets club. First walk of the game by Scott. And now here comes Backman. And when the Mets have scored all season long, this is the scene that you see. Backman hitting with Dykstra on first. Knight shortened up at third. Runner on first, forcing Davis to hold the inside corner of the back. And Scott intent on holding as close as possible. First time in this game that the Mets have gotten the leadoff batter on. Pitch is just outside. Ashby continues to look at Hal Lanier in the dugout. This is an ideal running situation. Take a lot of courage to pitch out right here. It's a pretty good chance Dykstra will be running and Backman will be hitting. Lifted to left field. Cruz going back, going back. Turns his back, makes an over-the-shoulder catch against the wall, and Dykstra has to hustle back to first. Looked like a wide receiver on a post pattern, didn't he? <laughs> well, this is an unusual version of the hit and run. Backman hits it. Now watch Cruz run. This is a very, very good play by Jose Cruz. Boom. Right in your dining room. <laughs> Man. So one out, and we have seen some outstanding defensive plays, that being the fourth one of the ball game. Keith Hernandez, who is one for two, is at the plate now. His last trip back in the fourth inning in a solid shot over the second baseman's head into right center for a base hit. Hernandez will peak, and I don't mean peak for the signs, but he'll see where a catcher is setting up. Watch his shifty eyes here. Not now, it's too late. They pitch out. And Baxter going nowhere. See, for instance, if Hernandez sees that Ashby might be sitting outside, it would have to be a fastball. Or a split finger fastball. You take all breaking balls away because no pitch by design from a right handed pitcher to a left handed hitter is going to be a breaking ball away. So it's kind of a process of elimination. If you see the catcher back there in some area, outside or inside, and that's what Hernandez tries to do. Well, Gary is one, Carter is the one that really helps when the batters yeah. start beating. Yes, he does. <laughs> he really hollers. <laughs> Working at keeping Dykstra close at first base with one out.
The Astros having squandered two big scoring opportunities in this ball game, leading one to nothing. And the match now, Mets now trying to manifest a threat in the top of the sixth inning. That throw was a little wild as Davis had to go over the top of Dykstra. And now Lenny wants to unload about four pounds of dirt out of his <laughs> bridge. That's an excellent play by Glenn Davis. If this ball goes in the right corner, Dykstra's on third base. Bluffs doesn't go. And the pitch is high. It's two balls and no strikes. And now Scott getting a little deeper. Extra walk to lead the inning. Backman chase Cruz to the wall and left. And the pitch is on the outside corner for a strike. Two and one now on Hernandez. Keith having a long look at Bud Harrelson down at third. Bud out of the coaching box at third. Sort of back of the bag. Well, the 2-1 count, probably the most ideal count on which to hit and run. Davey Johnson, a manager like Hal Lanier, who loves to put the runners in motion. Throw to first. You cannot be picked off in a hit and run situation. A stolen base situation, obviously you're taking more of a chance. But in a hit and run situation, the obligation is for the hitter to make contact. Not for you to steal second. Dykstra goes. Pitches foul back. And Hernandez comes out of there. Jaw set because he had his pitch. Well, all a manager can do is get you a good pitch where, where you can drive it, where you can hit the ball hard on the ground. And that's what Davey Johnson was trying to do. He got him that pitch, and Keith missed it. He fouled it back. And it's two and two. There's Bud Harrelson. Shortstop. And time's passed for the Mets. 2-2 pitch to Hernandez. Dykstra does not go. And the pitch misses for three balls and two strikes. And for the second time in the inning, Scott has gone to a full count. I'll tell you, that was a very, very close pitch. Hitters like Keith Hernandez are more apt to get pitches like that and Doug Harvey has a very very fair strike zone he's always consistent he's not going to give you that pitch two inches outside what do you say if you want a 25 inch plate put one out there <laughs> it's 17 inches that's all you're going to get Dykstra definitely running right here I would think with Hernandez a contact hitter up at the plate Full count. Dykstra goes. Good break. And the throw through to second base as Hernandez is called out by Harvey and did not like it. Well, I don't think Ashby liked it either. Hernandez very upset and umpires obviously have a longer fuse during the playoff series. That is the second out. I'll tell you why catchers don't like it, because Alan Ashby got a late call, and for that reason, delayed in throwing the ball to second yep, base. With the count three and one, three and two, you ask the umpire for a quick call. Harvey calls it a strike. Now, you can see Ashby doesn't know, so he figures I'll throw it anyway. Obviously, if it's ball four... Then he doesn't want to throw to second base. Dykstra does have a stolen base, and Hernandez is continuing. He is not pleased, though the pitch, it was on the black. Well, it's <laughs> it was a very, very close, close. pitch, I'll yep. tell you. Yes, it was. Now it's Gary Carter.
Two down and Dykstra at second base. I think because Doug Harvey called the 2-2 pitch a ball, Hernandez felt like the 3-2 pitch should have been called a ball. 2-2 may have been more in the strike area, accepted norm at least, than uh, 3-2. We were just talking about Doug's consistency, too. (laughs) (laughs) But he is is an excellent umpire and a very consistent umpire. Meantime, Scott has gone to ball one on Gary Carter. It's going to be a fastball inside. He gave location. Bouncing ball at third foul. And I was wrong. It was not a fastball inside. It was a split finger fastball. But the one thing a catcher doesn't want to do is with a runner on second base, in any way, shape, or form, give location. Because when you give location, it's got to be a fastball. Or, in this case, a split finger fastball. I'm kind of entertained by Daryl Strawberry creeping away from the on deck circle, getting over as far as he thinks the law will allow so he can take a good look at what Scott's throwing up there. Get a better peek, huh? <laughs> yeah, he's creeping out there as far as he can. One ball and one strike to Carter. Chops it foul, and it's one and two. Hernandez is still hot. Well, I'll tell you, the man has a pretty good eye. And he believes it was outside. The crowd now coming up for Scott as he goes one and two on Carter with two down and Baxter on second base in a one nothing game. Houston leading. They're rooting for the strikeout. And he almost threw it to the backstop. He has struck out seven, eight so far in the game. Eight strikeouts. Low and away for the third time in this inning he has gone to a full count guys uh, his colleagues are trying to calm him down a tad in the dugout but Hernandez is still steaming over that third strike called by Doug Harvey 3-2 to Carter strike three Nine strikeouts. He has struck out Gary Carter three times in the middle of the sixth. It is one nothing. The Houston Astros leading the New York Mets. Well, there's one of the senior members of the umpiring corps of the National League. And Keith Hernandez came out to his first base position still steaming. But let's go back to Gary Carter on the pitch he struck out on. This ball is right down the middle of the plate. And remember, we were talking about the psychological advantage of the split finger fastball. That was a regular fastball right down Broadway. And Gary Carter was the first to take issue with Doug Harvey earlier in the ball game. And he just took that pitch, and with a man in scoring position, you rarely see Carter do that. All right, for Houston, Kevin Bass hits a bullet to right, base hit. So the leadoff man in the bottom of the sixth inning for Houston is aboard. Remember now, the Astros squandered big opportunities in the second and fourth innings. Now, once again, they get that leadoff man aboard. And here is Jose Cruz. Also in the fifth inning with a runner at third and one out. That's right. At the infield end. Denny Walling grounded to Santana who nailed Hatcher at home. Jose Cruz has a single in his two previous trips. The Astros now have a total of seven hits off Dwight Gooden. This being the third time in the ball game that Houston has had the leadoff man aboard. That is, if you consider Bass the leadoff man after Davis had homered back in the second inning. So Bass has a double and a single in his three trips tonight.
Boy Cruz made a great play defensively in the top of the setting on Backman. Curveball bites the outside corner for a strike. Probably the most important defensive play. Because while Hernandez made two good plays, Knight made another good play, but no one was on when they made them. Hernandez still seething about that call strike three on that 3-2 pitch. Broken bat on that one. So Jose will get another stick as the ball goes foul. There's been no action so far in this game in the bullpen. The Mets with only two hits. The Astros with seven, but only one run has scored. Once the catcher flashes the sign, what do the middle infielders do to tell the other infielder who's covering should the runner run? Well, you open your mouth. If Wally Backman opens his mouth, that means Santana has it. If it's closed, that means I've got it. Santana's covering at fast runs. And Cruz strikes out on a fastball eye high. That is the second strikeout in the game. For Dwight Gooden. One out now for Alan Ashby. Ashby has one of the seven hits. If a curveball is flashed by the catcher and a left-handed hitter is more apt to pull the ball, then you'll find that the shortstop should cover. There's Santana, the shortstop, receiving the sign from Backman. And the pitch is high. Ball what? The reason the glove is held up, obviously, in front of the infielder's face is so the hitter can't tell who's covering. Because there are major league players with good enough bat control to take advantage of the vacated hole. Bass has good speed at first base. Backman's looking at Carter's sign right now. That's Hernandez there, but Backman in close at second, cheating. Well, Allen had a hack at it, didn't he? It's one and one. Those are the types of fastball, too, Keith, that, that left-handed hitters were swinging at last year. The year Gooden was 24-4, and 1.53 ERA. You've got to make good and get the ball down if you're going to hit it effectively. Here's back. Santana covers in case Bass runs. Bass does not go. Gooden takes something off of it and doesn't get the call. It's two balls and a strike. I think Keith's talking to Kevin about yeah. that. Oh, there it's right now. <laughs> it's another good hitter. <laughs> well, his teammates wouldn't listen to him. They were trying to console him. <laughs> now he's got Kevin. You rarely see Hernandez take the last pitch out on the field like he appears to be doing right now. Bass edges. Goes. Pitch. Curveball. Carter's throw. Not in time. Bass steals it. And Santana was covering. A tough pitch to throw. A breaking ball on the 2-1 count. And the breaking ball tougher to throw because it's a slower pitch. And it gives the, the runner that extra yard and a half. And Bass has it stolen easily. No contest. So with one out now, you got the runner in scoring position for Ashby with a count of three balls and one strike. And Houston still clinging to that one nothing lead. It's been the pitching duel we thought we'd see. 
Ashby walks. That's the third walk by Gooden. And now it's Craig Reynolds with the opportunity. I tell you, if Mike Scott comes up with the bases loaded again <laughs> and doesn't do something with it, he's going to have a fit. Because Scott is now on deck. Reynolds does not have a lot of pop the other way. He has line drive type of hitting ability the other way. Wilson too deep in left field right now. Breaking pitch is low. What a lot of outfielders do, the opposite fielders, they like to start off deep and then walk in as the pitch is on its way. And that's what Wilson elects to do here. But even when he ends up, he's too deep in left field. They chase Bass back at second base. Well, if this ball is hit to the outfield, I think you'll see Bass come home. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I think Minky, the third base coach, has got to start gambling a little bit, especially to stay away from the situation where Scott has been unsuccessful in two previous tries. Bases loaded, one out. That pitch is way up, and once again, Gooden is behind the hitter. You know, it's hard to believe Mike Scott never came up during the regular season with the bases loaded and he's done it twice in this game got a shot at doing it again what's going on here that's foul back and the count now on Reynolds is two and one and no one in this ballpark is in a more prayerful posture right now than Mike Scott Ball is hit high in the air to right field. Room for Strawberry. Steps just on the track, makes the catch, bass tags and hustles on down to third, two out. Ashby remaining at first base. And so once again, Mike Scott does not, comes to the plate with an opportunity to help himself but not in the same dramatic proportions the two previous trips. Well, he bats like he pitches. He strands a lot of runners as a pitcher, <laughs> and, he, and he does the same thing as a hitter. <laughs> well, if a pitcher ever needed the lesson to... Um, bear down... and <laughs> help himself... Do some extra work in the cage. This would be a classic example. A great argument for a manager, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. All the Lindsays are now trained on Scott and Gooden. And a high foul to the right side out of play. Astros have stranded five so far. That was Dwight Gooden's 97th pitch of the game. What is the average? About 110 to 115. But I don't think Davey Johnson's as concerned with Gooden's amount of pitches as Hal Lanier is with Mike Scott, because Scott may come back on Sunday. For the simple reason that Davey Johnson is committed to a four-man rotation, right. uh, whereas uh, Hal Lanier is committed to a three-man rotation. But David Johnson is dead right, I think. And he said, how in the world can you tell a Sid Fernandez or somebody who's had the kind of a season uh, they've had that they can't pitch in the championship series? They just simply can't do it.
Two strike count now on Scott. He's gone. Struck him out looking. So the Astros strand two more. They'd have now left seven on base. And they lead one to nothing after six. One of the original Mets was named Richie Ashburn, one of the colorful figures in baseball history. His memories of the Mets go like this from 1962. Well, I made the first out in Mets history in uh, the opening game in St. Louis. So, you know, when you think about the Mets, uh, you have to think about Casey and marvelous Marv Throneberry and Choo Choo Coleman. But I didn't think it was going to be a very good year. Uh, I, I joined the Mets from the Chicago Cubs. I didn't think it would be as bad as it was. You know, we lost 120 ball games, and one of the odd things about that was that um, I think because of Casey Stingle, we thought we were going to win every game we played. Now, that's tough to do. You know, when you when you're losing three out of every four games, it was a. Uh, it was a year that I would never have repeated, but uh, I tell you, I never would have missed it for anything. It's certainly a piece of baseball history. Darrell Strawberry, Mookie Wilson, and Ray Knight. Let me correct the left on base by Houston. It is eight and not seven in six innings. And now Strawberry leads the top of the seventh for the Mets. Mike Scott still on the mound, having given only two base hits. In the sixth inning, he went to a full count, three and two, on three hitters. And it took a great defensive play by Jose Cruz in left field against the wall, over the shoulder, running catch of Backman's long drive to keep the Mets off the scoreboard. One ball and two strikes now on Strawberry. That lady has particular pride in the night. Mike Scott's mom. Having come from California. It's way upstairs. So now Scott seems to be struggling just a bit with his mechanics, doesn't he? He looks out of sync. He did in the sixth inning. He struggled. He walked, walked Dykstra, but then he came back to strike out Hernandez and Carter after Dykstra had stolen second. That pitch is up high, and again, he's gone to a full count. Three and two. Darrell Strawberry, of course, was a heralded number one pick in the nation by the Mets in the 1980 free agent draft out of Los Angeles. I don't know if he's strung at a, swung at a strike or not. I don't think so. He strikes out anyway. Out of six pitches, I agree with you. All were balls, and Darrell Strawberry goes down on the 3-2 count. I'll tell you, I don't guess it's ever understandable to swing at bad pitches, but if there were ever a pitcher where it would be understandable because of Scott's movement, it's understandable when you swing at bad balls against him. Ball's he, moving all over the place. He now has ten strikeouts in the ball game, and here's Mookie Wilson hitless in two trips. Way up with that one. Starting to fuss with himself a little bit, too. You can see him walking around. There's Vicky. Mike's wife. I think that swallow tells everything about the pace of this game so far. <laughs> Ashby out for a talk now with a big right hander. One and one on the foul back to the screen. You wonder after the success that Scott has had with that split finger fastball that as you see Les Moss going out to talk to him probably about what you just mentioned Keith his rhythm he looks out of sync it looks like arms and elbows but he has been so successful with that split finger fastball. And he says that the, the week with Roger Craig was like a vacation if you can believe it. He said he had one and a half hour sessions broken down into 20 minutes of throwing. And then they talked the rest of the time. Most of the day played golf. Went to the movies. 1-1 one, one pitch to Mookie. And it's high. So it was not as grueling as one might think to learn that pitch of success. Two and one to Mookie. 
Well, he got one in that time, two and two. That thing started for the middle and just dove to the outside. Lifted into right. Bass on his horse. Makes the catch. Makes it look easy. Two down. And now Ray Knight. Raymond in the game has struck out and hit a fly ball to center. And it required a rather good running catch by Billy Hatcher coming in to, to get him. We are in the top of the seventh inning in a one nothing ball game. Houston leading. He's up, he's up, he's up, and he's up again. Now we've got some stirring around in the Mets pin. McDowell getting up and starting to loosen up in the New York Mets bullpen. Tell you, I'm not much of an advocate of guarding the line, but because of the unusual release of Scott's split finger fastball. If you get a pitch down and in, there's Walling on the line, then Knight could conceivably smoke it down the left field line for a double. So in this case, I suppose it's all right. Hal Lanier certainly thinks it's all right. Outside corner, Ray doesn't like it and walks away. Roger McDowell is a pitcher, too, and the only pitcher of the Mets that you could say has been pummeled by Houston. He's 0-3. Here's that tailing fastball again. Ashby doing a remarkable job of mixing Scott's pitches up tonight. And he's got a 1-2 count on Ray Knight with two down. Base is empty. Popped him up. It's going to come back out of play. There's McDowell warming up. If Knight should get aboard, Santana should do something, then obviously David Johnson with McDowell heating up would be ready to make a move. He may make a move with Santana and put Danny Heap or Lee Mazzilli in there to pinch it for him. Good. Mm -hmm. Back to the mound, gloved by Scott. Second time tonight, he's flagged down a hot one up the middle. And Ray Knight is retired, and so are the New York Mets. So in the middle of the seventh inning, it is still a one-run ball game. Houston leading one to nothing. Starting pitcher tomorrow night for Houston, the Express, Nolan Ryan. He's pacing the dugout. A one-nothing game. Houston leads. Astros batting. Bottom of the seventh inning. Dwight Gooden back on the mound. Delivers to the top of the order. Billy Hatcher. And it's fouled away for strike one. Bill Doran and Denny Wallen are scheduled to follow. Both pitchers now getting in that neighborhood where fatigue could conceivably become a factor. Charlie Kerfeld is uh, the one who has sold them on that. It's called, they call them the rally caps. They just simply turn their hats inside out, put them on, and expect something to happen because they won so many times this year late in games. Well, the Mets, the Mets have their own version of rally caps, so I guess it's the battle of the rally caps. One to nothing, though, bottom of the seventh. <laughs> and Hatcher with a one-strike count now is at two strikes. Obviously, they have not. Neither side has really been wearing those caps up to this time. Hatcher has walked, moved as far as second base, and fouls this off. When Billy was with the Cubs, Johnny Oates liked him. Remember Johnny Oates? Boy, what a tough guy he was. He said the kid would work and work and work and work and work. You'd have to run him off sometimes.
Two strike pitch. It's up. Dwight Gooden coming into the playoff series with a 284 earned run average and a 17 6 record. And though he has struggled tonight, his ball club is still right there. He struck out Hatcher and he may have done it on a pitch out of the strike zone, but he did it with a blazing fastball. I'll tell you, I think it's more than coincidence that three of the four strikeouts for Gooden has come in the last inning and a third. Three of the last four outs recorded have come on strikeouts. And you mentioned that he may be tiring, but I'll tell you, Dwight Gooden does have, as that guy can tell you. He's tired. He does, <laughs> <laughs> he does have the ability to reach back for a little extra when he needs it. Somebody ought to wake him up and remind him that seat costs a lot of money. You, you know, usually one nothing. <laughs> Usually one nothing games do put the crowd <laughs> asleep, but not this game. This uh -uh. is a marvelous ball game. <laughs> Doran taking, make it one and one. Moss and Lanier talking right there. Probably talking to the position man upstairs, I suppose. Or behind home plate. They do have a radar gun That's behind home plate. Yep. Mm -hmm. That ball is looped out into left. Mookie Wilson drifts back and will make the catch for out number two. They may be checking on the speed of Scott the last inning or the last half inning. They talk about that gun as being a slow gun, a slow radar gun. I've never quite understood that that some are slower than others but well, that is one of the slower radar guns maybe that's the one that caught the mailbox going 27 miles an hour <laughs> the tree huh <laughs> Denny Wallach is at the plate Denny has hit less than three trips tonight and Dwight starts him on the outside corner with a strike Starting to change his speeds a little more too as we're working uh, from the middle of the ball game on. Foul back. A lot of people discount the fact that it's the playoffs. Gut wrenching pressure. I'm telling you, it makes it makes the World Series look like a picnic. And almost every player that I've talked to, including myself. Agrees that it is it is I'm telling you water goes down in lumps <laughs> Water tastes like a well-done steak <laughs> Telling you <laughs> two strike pitch and Walling fouls it at the plate and stays alive with two out nobody on and a one nothing ball game McDowell now is quiet. He's gone back to the dugout Gene tennis told Jerry Klein and I a story before the ball game and he said that Blue Moon Odom was pitching in the 1972 playoff series against the Detroit Tigers. And after six innings, he came in, he started shaking, and he just could crying. He could not go back out there for the seventh inning. The pressure was absolutely too much for him. Took something off the curve, and it dipped just below the strike zone. And it's one and two. I mean, when a when a guy with over 4,200 hits, and I'm talking about Pete Rose, the only one to ever do it, talks about the playoffs as though it were a vice, <laughs> then you know you got to listen. Walling swings and misses and strikes out. So Gooden now with five strikeouts in the ball game, he's heating up. We'll be back after this word from your local station. John Candelaria, who will figure importantly in what happens for the California Angels in the American League Championship Series, holds the National League Championship Series record for strikeouts in a game when he was with Pittsburgh with 14. Mike Scott tonight has 10, and right now Scott goes out to face Lee Mazzilli. Mazzilli, with uh, 54 appearances as a pinch hitter, came up with eight hits since coming back to the Mets. And Scott starts him out with a strike. It's amazing how 
some things happen. In spring training, rumor had it that the Pittsburgh Pirates turned down a trade Ray Knight for Lee Mazzilli. And then the Mets eventually picked up Lee Mazzilli later on in the season. As you see, Danny Heap will pinch hit for Gooden. Heap, of course, was a member of the 1980 Houston team that lost in five games to the Phillies in the championship series. Mazzilli fouls it away to the left side. Well back. Of course, Mazzilli started with the New York Mets. 1986, though, he had a triple-A contract and went down and gutted it out with Tidewater and played six games and got a call, and here he is. Young Italian, Brooklyn-born, swings and misses and strikes out, and Scott has 11 tonight. Now here comes another left-handed hitter, Danny Heap. So Mike Scott setting a National League playoff record with that 11 strikeout. No, no he's got nope. a 14. John oh, 14. Candelari. My fault. My fault. Candelari. Candel I tell you, John I looked pretty good his last couple of outings. Too. I'll tell you, I think I think Candelaria lost that ball game on a home run by Pete Rose, and I think that was the he lost that game a home run by Pete Rose at Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. Danny Heat stands at the plate. And ball one to him. Dave Smith now, who has 33 saves, a new club record for Houston, is up in the pen for Houston. And ball two to Danny Heat. Danny will make you find the strike zone. He still lives in San Antonio. Fouled at the plate, two and one. 30 pinch hitting appearances. He had nine base hits. And back in 1983, led the major leagues with four pinch hit home runs. That's what Davey Johnson would like to see here, obviously. Sir. Sure. One out. Base is empty. Up the middle it goes. Hits the mound. Slows it down. Goes through. Reynolds. And let's look back to Scott here quickly. He's a little slow to get up. He came down on his right hand and arm. But seems to be all right. Well, the players talk about all the soft spots in this carpet, and it appeared that ball did some tricks when it was around second base. As Danny Heap will have a pinch runner insert. It's Kevin Elster, the young shortstop. That ball did a lot of funny tricks and stayed down, and Reynolds had no play. So Elster with speed at first base now, and here's Lynn Dykstra. Orozco in the New York bullpen now, and Smith in the Houston bullpen. one nothing Astros lead. Ball is hit to the right side. Great play for it. Back to first, throws it in the dirt. Davis can't handle it. And there are two Mets aboard. Doran looked at second base. If he had given up on the runner going to second base and concentrated on uh, Dykstra coming down the line, he might have gotten a play on him. But he took the time to look at second, as you'll see here, and he just simply couldn't twist and make the play. One look is worth a thousand words. And in this case, about two steps. Davis at Davis held on to the ball. The ball hit the heel of his glove. Had he held on to it, possibility of getting the call at first. But an infield hit for Dykstra. Now the Mets have four base hits. You have one out. Elster at second. Dykstra at first. The batter is Backman. And on deck, guess who? Hernandez. That's where a left-handed reliever would come in handy now, too. Yep. You get Backman out of the game and have Hernandez, but as we said in the opening, the Astros have to rely on Jim Deshays as their left-handed reliever. I wouldn't think they want to go middle of the inning with Deshays either. No, I don't either. Start him all right, but uh, not in the middle of the inning. That's a foul ball at the plate. Yeah, bring in a man relegated primarily for short duty like a Dave Smith, even though you want Smith as your clincher. But a guy like Charlie Kerfell or Larry Anderson, Danny Darwin, and then have Deshays start another inning. We are in the top of the eighth inning. 
Houston leading one to nothing. And this would appear to be their most severe threat of the ball game. The pitch is high. As a matter of fact, Keith, it's only the second runner that the Mets have had at second, second base. base. Nobody on third yet. The inning started with Mazzilli striking out. He banged one back up the middle that Smith couldn't get to, Reynolds couldn't get to. And Dykstra grounded one to the right side that Doran made a great play on but couldn't make a play at first base. Backman swings and misses on the split-fingered fastball, and it's one ball and two strikes. The only run scoring back in the second inning on a leadoff home run by Glenn Davis. Mike Scott dominant through five, but since the sixth inning, he's been wobbly. Crowd coming up now. He has 11 strikeouts in the game. One, two to Backman. Swung on and missed. He has 12 strikeouts. And more importantly, perhaps under this circumstance, he has two outs. But here comes a man with a purpose. Keith Hernandez. Here's the strikeout of Backman. It appeared to be a fastball, and it was. A fastball that tailed away. And that, more than any other pitch, is the pitch that Hernandez talks about. Scott scuffing and cutting is the tailing fastball that goes away from the left-handed hitter. Now, remember, Hernandez struck out looking back in the sixth inning with a man on second base. And he was furious about it, stormed about it for a full inning. And now he's up there. Two out and two on. And Hernandez looked downtown with that swing and missed it. Dickie Thon has gone down into the bullpen for Houston shortstop to warm up. He may go in as a defensive player. One strike on Hernandez. Pitch is just high. This is an interesting matchup here as the tension builds and builds and builds. Hernandez and Scott. Foul left side drifting back and it's in the seats. One ball and two strikes. Everybody on their feet, including the Mets dugout. One and two on Hernandez. Two out and two on. Top of the eighth inning. Struck him out. Mike Scott has 13 strikeouts. He'll never do a better job of pitching than he just did against Keith Hernandez, and Houston still leads one to nothing. The two changes now for the New York Mets. Kevin Elster goes to shortstop, replacing Santana, and Orozco comes in in the eighth inning in relief of Dwight Gooden. And he faces Glenn Davis. 
Gooden, seven innings, seven hits, one run. It was earned, a 400-foot home run by Davis. He walked three, and he struck out five. And he threw 111 pitches. And Davis fishing against the Roscoe. Fouls it away, and it's two strikes. Orozco, with a record of 8-6, and six, earned run average impressive 2.3, appeared in 58 games during the regular season. Kevin Bass on deck, Jose Cruz to follow. Davis fishing for an outside pitch. Knight comes in to ground, to grab the ground ball and throw him out by a half step. So that's one down. Now Bass, two for three, a single and a double in tonight's ball game, and this time Kevin will turn around and go from the right side, which is his power side. But Orozco, who moves the ball around, changes speeds, has something twisting on it all the time, a difficult man to take deep. He throws a tailing fastball, a breaking ball, and he has been working on a split-fingered fastball. And he's in with a strike. Bass hits it hard, up the alley. Strawberry loping over those long legs, and he hauls it in. Deceptively fast. Two down. CFA football this coming Saturday on ABC. Miami, number one, at West Virginia in Morgantown. Oklahoma, number six, at the Cotton Bowl against the Texas Longhorns. That follows our game on Saturday. We begin at noon Eastern time, and then comes football, and then comes the American League Championship Series from the West between the Angels and the Red Sox. With two out, Jose Cruz in, swings and tips it foul back to the plate. Mike Scott faces the Mets one more turn for a complete game. Orozco in relief of Good is low, and it's one ball and one strike to Cruz. I'll tell you, the eyes are certainly the windows of the soul, and that Scott looks like the calmest soul in this ballpark right now. He does. <laughs> Not even sweating. Two strikes on Jose. Orozco ready. At 1-2, struck him out. So Jesse Orozco comes on in the bottom of the eighth inning, and he puts down the Astros quietly, the middle of the order. And going to the ninth, it's 1-0 Houston. In the top of the ninth inning, the last chance for the Mets. Mike Scott will pitch to the middle of the order. Gary Carter, Daryl Strawberry, and Mookie Wilson... Mike Scott has struck out Gary Carter three successive times and starts him with a strike here. one nothing, Houston. Opening game, National League Championship Series. Strike two on a split-fingered fastball that just dove under the bat of Carter. I'm a little surprised the Astro defense is not playing Carter as strictly a pull hitter. But I guess that's another indication of Scott's effectiveness. Third Third base way. Walling's throw on the money. One out. Davey Johnson, Mel Stottlemyre, Gary Carter going to the dugout, shaking his head. 1984, this man Scott was at a crossroads in his career. Al Rosen, he says, was the man that stuck with him. 
And he thanks him for that. And he's turned it around. And here he is facing Strawberry. And Darrell fouls it back. Strawberry has struck out twice tonight against Scott. Scott just one strikeout away from tying the National League Championship Series record held by John Candelaria at 14. The one strike pitch to Strawberry is just outside. Coleman and Boddicker have 14 in the American League Championship Series. Strawberry hits it hard. It is on a bounce and flagged by Kevin Bass. And that's base hit number five for the Mets. And they're still alive with Daryl on first base. That ball was nailed. He just didn't get it up. As a matter of fact, the game that Scott started against Gooden, the only game this year, Daryl Strawberry tied that game with a two-run homer off Dave Smith, who is continuing to throw in the Astro bullpen. Now one of the questions with Wilson hitting, do you send Strawberry at first? 27 stolen bases on the year. Make that 28. Mookie Wilson at the plate. Ray Knight to the on-deck circle. You got one out. And a swing and a foul at the plate. Wilson has struck out. Bounced back to the pitcher. And hit a fly ball to right field. If it should go seven, you've got to figure Scott gets three calls. Well, unless he's thrown so many pitches tonight striking out Mets that he can't come back effectively on Sunday. That being the case, then DeShays would move into the rotation. That's a foul ball, and it's strike two. Ojeda and Ryan tomorrow night in game two. Beginning at 8 Eastern time here on ABC. Two strike pitch to Wilson. Strawberry goes. Pitch is high. Throw too late. He's stolen it. Big jump. Yeah, he picked an outstanding pitch on which to run. The bad news if you elect to run on the 0-2 pitch is a catcher feels comfortable calling for a pitch out. But that was a waste pitch. And Alan Ashby did not get rid of the ball in a hurry. And Strawberry has it easily. One and two coming to Wilson. Fouled away. Oh, I tell you, this game for a one nothing ball game <laughs> has had everything in the world in it, hasn't it? Great well, defense it plays. Most of the time, low scoring ball games are, are a purest form of baseball, not this one. Popped him up. It's going to come back. Ashby's going to come back and have a look at it. And it's just out of his reach. Caught just on the top of the screen. Just out of his reach. And Ashby didn't see that ball initially. He thought it was way out of play. And then Scott, I believe, motioned to him over his head. And that's when he reacted. That was no more than a foot back on the screen. Smith is not very busy now. Bullpen, <laughs> he's watching. He's become a spectator. He's saying, <laughs> "I am warm." One, two to Wilson. Swing and a foul at the plate, and Ashby can't hang on. I'm not even sure Allen had a chance at that one. He might have just beaten it right down in the dirt. Here's Dave watching from the Houston pen. Rod, uh, Roger McDowell is over in the New York pen, and he's throwing occasionally.
fisted foul out of play. Tell you what's interesting, the outfield depth of the Astros, they are not that deep. Wilson has good power and can hit a ball a long way to right center and down the line. But the Astros outfielders are playing shallow for a possible play at the plate on a base hit. The right smothered by Davis throws to the pitcher covering at first. And what did he call it? Called him out. Got a B from Bill Robinson. The umpire, Lee Wire, is over showing where Scott hit the bag with his foot. And you got two down. And how close can it be as Strawberry hustled over to third? Well, I'll tell you, Glenn Davis is saying Keith Hernandez is not the only guy who could play defense. The dive and then the throw to Scott. Robinson's contention was that he did not touch the bag. We'll see. Yeah, it looks like he did. Looks as though he did to me. Yep, he did. In fact, he's got his toe yeah, hooked that's under. right. That's right. The so, agony of defeat. Oh, of defeat, yes. <laughs> Now it's up to Ray Knight with Strawberry on third in a one nothing ball game. Two down for the Mets. Just low. The former Astro. Here's another look at the play at first. There's no question about the fact the man sticks his foot right in underneath the bag. He touched the bag with the tip of his right foot. Ray Knight, who played here, struggled here. Swings and fouls it away. And it's one and one. Howard Johnson has come to the on-deck circle now for the New York Mets. If Knight can do something. The pitcher, Orozco, would be scheduled next. That's why Johnson's out there. It is just off the outside corner. And it's two balls and one strike. By the way, Daryl Strawberry is the first Met to reach third, third base, base in this ball game. The battle right now is between Scott and Knight. 2-1. Two, 2-2. One. Two and, two. and Knight screams over the call. Well, we'll see if Ray has a legitimate beef or not. On the 2-1 split finger fastball. It's very close. Very, very close. Everybody up. It's two and two with two out. The tying run at third base in the top of the ninth inning for the Mets. Mike Scott trying to win it right here. Struck him. That strikeout 14, it ties the National League Championship Series record. The Houston Astros have defeated the New York Mets by a score of one to nothing on a five hitter by Mike Scott. Mike Scott on 125 pitches wins the ball game, a five hitter. He walked one, struck out 14. He got Carter three times, Hernandez three times, Strawberry twice, Backman, uh, Knight twice, Backman, Wilson, Mazzilli, and Gooden once. For a total of 14, which ties the National League Championship Series strikeout record held by John Candelaria when he was with the Pittsburgh Pirates. So Mike Scott, 18-10 and 10 on the regular season, 
but finished with a flourish. Clinching it for Houston with a no-hitter is the winner here in the Astrodome tonight. We'll talk to him in a moment. All right, let's turn our attention now to Mike Scott, who was absolutely, as the sign says, sensational tonight. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. 125 pitches in the ball game tonight. Now, what does this mean in looking ahead to your second call? Well, I've pitched for three days rest rest before. I think my body will be strong enough. I don't have any problem getting pumped up. Uh, My arm felt good towards the end of the game today. So, uh, you know, I've done that about 13 or 14 times this year. And I had no problems throwing three days rest earlier. Mike, uh, with Al Rosen so instrumental in your career, and of course Roger Craig, it seems a little strange that they're both with the San Francisco Giants now. Well, that's the way things turn out. Roger talked to me before he got the job over there, and uh, I was lucky he was between jobs when he t- taught me that pitch, or else uh, I'd be in trouble. In the sixth inning, you had a man on second base, and in the eighth inning, there was a moment of wobble. Was there any time when you felt that you were, I thought you were fussing a little bit, maybe in the fifth, sixth, and seventh inning with your mechanics? Well, in the seventh inning, I struggled a little bit. I uh, I kept getting the ball up. I tried to stay back, obviously. Les Moss was told me that I wasn't at the time, and I th- got things together after that. But I had a little problems in the seventh inning keeping the ball down. When Gary Carter, Mike, when he complained about you possibly scuffing the ball in the first inning, did you feel like that was a psychological for you? Well, I I don't think it makes any difference to me. That's been going on ever since I learned the pitch, and it certainly wasn't a surprise that he did that. They've been talking about it for a month, so uh, I don't think uh, it makes any difference to me. If they think I'm doing things like that, I think it helps me. Well, we look forward to seeing a craftsman work again. You've had a marvelous season, and it looks to me like uh, you've got some other things in mind before this one is done. Thank you, Keith. Mike Scott, the winner in tonight's ball game. A five-hitter. He struck out 14 to tie the National League Championship Series record and won it one to nothing.